Hi everyone, welcome back to the Domain Podium. This is Ramesh Chuk, and today's interview mock is all about pre-authorization. So let's get started. Hi Vivek, how are you doing? Thanks, Ramesh. I'm doing good. And how about you? Yeah, all good. Thanks. Thanks for asking. So Vivek, today we will talk about pre-authorization. First of all, if you can help me understand what is pre-authorization. Sure. Pre-authorization, also called as authorization hold, is a show of commitment by the card holder that the funds are good. It is used by merchants also to lower their risk. Uh, there is no actual charge or movement of cash money. It is just an assurance to the merchant that the card holder has sufficient funds in their account and other card details like expiry date, CVV, card number, etc. are valid. It is just a temporary hold on the account. Okay. Vivek, uh, can you give me some examples where pre-authorization can be used? Yep. Pre-authorization is used in use cases where the exact amount of sale is not known at the time of transaction. Typical examples are uh, the hotel and resort industry. When a user uh, checks in, uh, the hotel would like to just take a pre-authorization hold because the exact amount of the customer's duration of stay in the hotel may not be final. There could also be some incidental expenses. Mm-hmm. And hence, whenever a authorization amount, the actual purchase amount is not fully known, merchants prefer to take a pre-authorization. Other examples are also taxi rides, where uh, a user could extend their journey. Uh, Another good example is a bar tab, where a person hands over the card to a bar counter, but they are not sure how many drinks they will consume. Okay, but what is the benefit uh, of using a pre-authorization for a merchant? Why does a merchant, you know, uh, want to use a pre-authorization in these kind of scenarios, whatever examples you took? Sure. Uh, A very good example would be taxi rides, where often people make taxi bookings and then they cancel. Another example are e-commerce, where the the merchant may not have the goods to send for an online order or could have partial order fulfillment. So cases where whether it is a hotel, a taxi ride, or an e-commerce merchant, and orders are frequently changing, cancelled, and so on, merchants would like to avoid the process of refunds because refunds incur interchange fee as well as transaction charges. Yes. In cases where a person cancels an order and uh, or it is partially cancelled, Issuing a refund is expensive for the merchant. It's an operational cost. They would like to avoid uh, such charges. The other good advantage is that uh, interchange fees paid by merchants on a transaction only happens at the time of completion. So if a hotel is booked, say, a month in advance, the merchant did not uh, uh, pay the interchange fees. It will be only paid at the time of completion. If the order is cancelled, no interchange moves from the merchant at all. So this is a very good advantage that merchants uh, yeah. love to do pre-authorization. Exactly. Because merchant doesn't have to pay any interchange just in case if any customer is, you know, cancelling the pre-authorization or maybe cancelling his stay in the hotel. Yeah. So my next question that I want to ask you is, Vivek, typically in how many steps... Okay. A pre-authorization can be completed with respect to an issuing system as well as from a merchant or acquiring side also. You can use uh, issuer as well as the acquirer in your answer. I just want to understand how many steps typically you know, are required to complete a pre-authorization. A pre-authorization, once the sale is confirmed, 
is completed using a process known as capture or completion, in which a merchant sends a message to the scheme that the sale is final. Typically, a uh, Authorization would be completed in a single step, which is just straight completion, or it could take more than one steps. For example, there could be an advice followed by application, or it could uh, be uh, in several other step stages. For example, there could be a reauthorization reversal, there could be a preauthorization partial reversal, and so on. So typically, the simplest would be one steps, but there could be more. Okay, you said there can be an advice as well, which is a completion advice, which is typically an MTA of zero one two zero or zero two two zero, depending on whether it is single message system or dual message system. So, just in case when any issuer receives a completion advice, okay, which is an offline message, can an issuer you know, decline an advice message, uh, such a uh, advice message, which is a completion of the pre-authorization. Like, do any issuers have that option to decline? No, issuers cannot decline an offline message. It is um, only for them to acknowledge. Very good. Yeah. So, because the nature of an advice message message is, it is an offline kind of you know transaction. Offline means customer may not be present when merchant is actually initiating such an offline advice and for that reason since customer himself is not available customer may have already checked out from the hotel and he probably you know would have already left the hotel so since customer is not available this is the primary reason in that kind of scenarios when a merchant is initiating a completion advice which is at 0120 or as i said 0220 these kind of advice messages, any issuers, or to be honest, any a player in the payment ecosystem, be it acquirer, card network, or issuer, no one can actually decline such kind of completion, offline completion advices. So your answer is right. Issuer should not decline, and issuer cannot actually decline an advice message. Now, uh, if I ask you a slightly different question, uh, uh, Vivek, for example, if a customer is checking into hotel for two nights, think of this way. But uh, maybe, you know, he suddenly realized that he may have to extend his stay for another two days or three days, whatever it is. So like merchant, from merchant side, what are the various options available for a merchant to place an additional hold to the cardholder account? Is there a way? Uh, that merchant can, uh, you know, extend the stay and and also place an additional host to the hold to the cardholder record. Yep. Uh, typically, a hotel uh, in a scenario where the customer presented the card at the time of checking in, or mm -hmm. the booking was made prior through an online system or through mm -hmm. online travel agents, but the card details are available with uh, mm -hmm. the hotel the merchant. They can issue what is called an incremental pre-authorization. So they could uh, extend the amount of authorization, which again gives them a validity of up to 30 days to do a completion or capture. So incremental auth is one such way. Uh, I, To be honest, merchant can also complete the previous authorization. It's up to the merchant. right? They can complete the previous pre-authorization and then they can initiate a new one also, but your answer is correct. Uh, typically merchant what what they do is like they just increment the previous authorization which can place in any issuing system another hold on the cardholder account you just now mentioned about the completion and the clearing of the pre-authorization right what is the difference in these two type of messages completion advice and a clearing message a completion advice is a 0120 message which is uh, like information to the issuers of the completion of the sales. Whereas the actual capture or clearing is sent to schemes as a 1240 or a presentment message, which yeah. is uh, for the issuer to perform the settlement. Exactly. And what about ISO data elements, uh, uh, Vivek? How an issuer can actually identify whether it is a pre-authorization or a normal retail transaction? Sure. 
A pre-authorization request is identified in the ISO message when the value of uh, data element 61, which is point of service data, uh, the subfield 7, which is the post transaction status, uh, contains a value of 4. That's how a pre auth is uh, determined. Is, uh, and this is applicable to Visa or MasterCard? I think MasterCard. Or MasterCard. Yes, right, right. And what about any other data element? Do you know the possible value in data element 25? Um, no, D25, I'm not so sure, Amish. Some of the merchants, uh, sometimes they also includes data element 25 value as 06 against either pre-authorization or pre-auth completion. So this is another data element. An issuer can actually rely on it and can sometimes use. But otherwise, you are right. Data element 61 typically, uh, uh, you know, any issuer can use to identify a pre-authorization. Now let's talk about AFD transactions we make. So first of all, can you help me understand what is AFD? Sure. Uh, AFD uh, transaction, uh, Ramesh, is typically also an authorization or 0100 message, except that uh, the merchant are typically the automated fuel dispenser, which is what AFD stands for. And uh, these are recognized by the merchant category code of 5542. So an authorization message coming from a merchant category code of 5542 typically of the amount of $1 is how you recognize an AFD transaction. And Vivek, are you familiar with the minimum and the maximum uh, limit of an AFD authorization? Sure. Uh, an AFD transaction typically has uh, two steps. The first mm -hmm. is an initial authorization and followed by an uh, authorization advice. Now, mm -hmm. When a customer uh, walks in and hands over the card to the actual uh, auto fuel dispenser machine or terminal, uh, the first authorization that is sent to the card networks is that of one dollar. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, when the user has completed uh, pumping fuel to their vehicle, mm -hmm. the, depending on the amount of fuel consumed or uh, pumped. The final authorization advice or the completion advice contains the actual amount of uh, the transaction depending on usage. Now, minimum amount for AFD transactions is $1 and the maximum it can be is $175. Okay. Um, I'll give you one scenario and then help me understand how an issuer can configure their uh, any transaction switch to take a decision on that kind of scenario. So let's assume that a customer is performing an EFT transaction of $1. And as you mentioned, the maximum limit to complete an EFT is $175 for a consumer. Okay. So what if a customer does not have $175 as a balance? in his account but the AFD is being received for one dollar so how issuer is going to respond to these kind of EFT transactions sure uh, Ramesh AFD transactions have in the past been subjected to a lot of uh, fraudulent uh, cases because of which issuers take mm -hmm. a conservative approach of inflating the initial one dollar authorization to a bigger value now, depending on countries and uh, different merchants, uh, these values are configurable. For example, an issuer might set to decline if transactions if the cardholder does not have at least 100 or 120 in their bank account. Uh, the best case scenario is 175, but some issuers also configure yeah. it at 100 or 120. Yeah, exactly. So this is configurable and most issuers, depending on the region, could be different for US or Australia. So they are, you know, configuring their system to accordingly decline the transaction if customer does not have that limit available in his account. So my last question um, about the ISO data elements. So what is uh, the difference between a pre-authorization and AFD 
what are the additional ISO data elements that I think you did mention about one of the MCC code, right? To identify the AFD transaction. But is there any other difference between a pre-authorization or AFD in terms of ISO 8583? Uh, MCC code of 5542, which is for uh, mm -hmm. auto fuel dispensers, the best criteria mm -hmm. to uh, identify a AFD transaction. And the value is typically a uh, dollar one. Yeah. And rest of the data elements are same as pre-authorization, Vivek. Yes, that's right. The B61 post uh, sub element five values are the same. Okay, thank you so much, Vivek. Thanks for your time. See you in the next session. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye.